Welcome to the course. Um, now my, my goal here is to offer you an opportunity to learn a lot about Austrian economics and especially uh, what we call Austrian social theory or Austrian political economy uh, just in general in addition to uh, different aspects of war. And if you look over the reading list, uh, there are a lot of real classic articles by uh, uh, von Mises, Rothbard, Lionel Robbins was also a member of the Austrian school. And uh, so I hope uh, the emphasis here is on learning. It's not so much grades and documentation and, and all that, um, but learning. And so that's what I usually give about a 45-minute lecture. And what I try to do in the lectures is to clarify a few things that I think uh, might need clarifying in some of the readings. And of course, I add my own uh, additional uh, thoughts and uh, and comments uh, as we go based on my own research, my own reading that's uh, outside of uh, uh, what I've asked you to read on the course on the course material. And so after that, we usually have about 45 minutes also of Q&A. And I guess for tonight, uh, we'll use the public chat. We usually have the forum that I usually uh, take a look at questions students have submitted in advance. And I've printed out a minute or two before the class. And then uh, when the class is over, I can answer the questions it's still online. But we'll use um, we'll use the chat for tonight, I guess. And uh, Grayson can interview uh, intervene at any time if we have any problems. And somebody we're still uh, speaking at once. I guess we have two two feeds going. I'm just trying to read the chat here. Put Grayson off, I guess. Okay. Okay, well, let's, let's get started. I want to. I'd like to talk about uh, some of the, these classic writings by von Mises on uh, on war, and uh, he talks uh, about um, the pre-French Revolution era. The French Revolution began in 1789, uh, the very year the American Constitution was ratified, and he talks about uh, the philosophy of boundless conquest. Uh, and now, this was in the pre-capitalist era for the most part when uh, it was uh, thought by the European monarchs that the way to enrich your nation is essentially to steal your neighbor's property. And so you had this philosophy of boundless conquest. And the one thing that stuck, stood in the way was that uh, the vassals uh, resisted. They, they resisted being used as cannon fodder and as tax slaves. And uh, they were very effective at it. And that forced the, uh, the European monarchs to resort, to resort to mercenaries. And so the, the costs of war were borne primarily by the monarchs, by the kings, who had to hire the, the mercenaries. And the benefits of war went to the kings, who fought each other over various things, and of course to the mercenaries who got paid to fight the wars. And so these cost limitations limited the conquest uh, and for many, many centuries uh, that Mises is writing about. Uh, war was fairly limited uh, and, uh, by the cost factor. And the second thing that limited uh, the wars was that if any one monarch became too aggressive and too successful, uh, well, the other monarchs would not sit by and wait until it was their turn. They would form coalitions. And uh, if they didn't uh, literally oppose the, uh, the aggressor, uh, they, would, they would create a deterrent by, by forming a coalition. And so uh, just that limited warfare to, uh, to uh, fairly small wars, certainly by today's standard, by the 20th century standards, or even by the standards of the American Civil War, uh, everything was very, very, very limited. So that prior to uh, 1789, the French Revolution, uh, the wars were fought by small mercenary armies. Uh, they concerned the rulers only. The people um, didn't have a lot to do with wars. Uh, and as we know, as we know of it today, and the citizens generally considered all war to be against their own their own interests, and uh, did not want to participate. It wasn't a part of what the government was for, as far as uh, they were concerned. It was only an affair of the king, and of course there were many theories about peace. And the, the first one, uh, how to achieve peace, and the first one that uh, Mises mentions is the idea that democracy will create peace. This became popular with the French Revolution, but of course the French proved this uh, theory to be quite dubious from the very beginning, because as, as Mises points out, uh, Napoleon uh, was not exactly a peaceful man. So there, they, the aggression of Napoleon sort of 
cast a, a big shadow over this theory that democracy was necessary for peace. Uh, and the next thing Mises uh, looks at is um, the so-called Manchester liberals. Uh, I don't assume everyone here uh, knows what a Manchester uh, liberal is, but he's referring to Manchester, England, uh, and the two most prominent names are Cobden and Bright, two, two businessmen named Cobden and, Cobden and Bright. And anyone can look them up on the web. There's been a lot written about uh, uh, Cobden and Bright. And they were businessmen who became free traders. They became crusaders for free trade in England and for freedom in general. Uh, they were both they were involved in the anti-slavery movement in England also. But uh, from an economic perspective, they're, they're best known for starting the free trade movement. They, they started up their own newspapers. They, uh, they influenced legislation. They went all over England uh, speaking in whatever platform would allow them to speak. And in a relatively short number of years, they led to the fact that by 1850, uh, England adopted free trade. It abolished all tariffs they, they, with the repeal of the um, so-called corn laws. And these were laws that put uh, protectionist tariffs on food, and corn was just sort of a, you know, a, an all-purpose name for food, tariffs on food. And uh, they eliminated this. They eliminated the so-called corn laws. Which, and so um, Britain went on the road to free trade afterwards. And so when, when Mises talks about um, Manchester liberals, that's what he's talking about. He's referring to, and they were in Manchester, England. That's what he's referring to. And uh, on the subject of war, what the Manchester liberals uh, added was the recognition that democracy is not enough to deter war. Uh, France proved that. Uh, what you also needed was laissez-faire. You needed uh, free markets and free trade because of the, the common sense idea that if people can, can prosper by taking advantage of the international division of labor, uh, whereby we all specialize in something and we produce that thing in return for money, in return for payment, and then we use our money to buy goods and services from other people all around the world who specialize in, in other things, and we buy the, get the best deals that we can, if we can prosper that way, it's much less uh, burdensome and costly than war. Nothing is more costly than war. Uh, and, and of course, war only benefits, uh, in the end, uh, the kings, the politicians, the monarchs, uh, the military establishment, and, and everyone around it. But the ordinary citizen never benefits uh, from war. Uh, even successful wars, uh, successful just wars, if you will, uh, uh, usually harm the average citizen. And so uh, that's what the Manchester liberals added to this. And, uh, and that, that was one of the arguments they made in favor of free trade. And if you think about it, uh, the, the case for free trade, uh, what, you know, what do countries do when they are at war with each other with regard to trade? What, the first, one of the first things they always try to do is to put into place trade embargoes in order to, uh, da they know that that will damage their, their opponent's economy. So really protectionism, is something that we do to ourselves in peacetime what our enemies would like to do to us in wartime. And uh, if, you, if you want to just think about the issue of free trade versus protectionism and those line, along those lines, uh, you'll see the futility of trying to interfere with the international division of labor. Uh, it's not only a money matter, it can be very dangerous, it can lead to war, and it has led to wars in many instances in history. And we'll be reading all about this and talking all about this in the next several weeks in, in the class. And so, uh, and there's an old saying, uh, Friedrich Bastiat was famous for uh, popularizing this. I don't think, I'm not sure that he was the inventor of this phrase, but if, if goods can't cross borders, armies will. Uh, in other words, uh, that was a, a perfect expression of Manchester liberalism. If goods can't cross borders, armies will. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Hayek, or Hayek, uh, uh, Bastiat said this in the late 1840s and all of the European history that he was familiar with, and some American history prior to that, um, led him to believe that this was certainly true, that economic interventionism, especially with regard to trade, if it impoverishes your trading partners, uh, sometimes the trading partners have no resort but uh, to war and conquest uh, as a substitute for free trade and the international division of labor as a way of making a living. Okay. And so the, the next thing that Mises uh, talks about is aggressive nationalism. 
as, a, as a leading to, as being the result of economic interventionism. And what does this mean, economic interventionism and planning? Well, uh, a nationalist is someone who, uh, who favors the aggrandizement of the state for the sake of the state. Uh, you can look at a patriot as something different. A patriot is something who, uh, who has a, a, a love or admiration for his country and its people, or at, least, uh, at least most of them, not every last one, uh, as opposed to uh, having a, a, an attachment to the state per se. And so uh, for, for generations, the, uh, the economic nationalists have sought policies like protectionism would be the, the classic economic nationalist policy. Uh, or the, the the subsidies, taxpayer subsidies to the, the countries, certain countries, political or companies, politically connected companies in your country, uh, to help them supposedly compete better against companies from other con countries. Uh, but of course, this is a way of uh, uh, skewering the economy in terms of diverting resources toward these subsidized, politically favored companies at the expense of other companies in your own country. So economic nationalism is really a sham when you think about it because it never uh, subsidizes all companies in one nation. It's only the politically connected that really uh, ever benefit at the expense of other companies. Uh, one good example would be uh, when President Bush, uh, one of the first things he did, George W., was to put 35% um, tariffs on steel. Uh, well, the steel industry like that, as long as it lasted, but all the steel industry, steel using industries were harmed. The American car industry was harmed because uh, the cost of steel went up. And that's, that's a classic economic nationalism policy, protectionism, but it never helps the nation. It only helps the politically connected within the nation. And that's what uh, Mises is talking about here. And so uh, in extreme cases, if, if you ever ran across a book, there's a book called Day of Deceit. Uh, by Roy Stinnett, S-T-I-N-N-E-T-T, -T, I believe is how he spelled his name. It's about Pearl Harbor. And uh, Roy Stinnett uh, was a World War II veteran. He became a newspaper reporter for the rest of his life uh, after he uh, got out of the, the Army as a young man in, the, in, in California. And he went to the National Archives and, and for many, many years researched Pearl Harbor. And one of the things that he writes about is how uh, American policy uh, was one of the reasons, not the only reason, why Japan, before World War II, was starved of oil. It was an intentional policy of the U.S. government under the Roosevelt administration to be antagonistic uh, toward Japan and cutting off a lot of the oil supplies from around the world because to this day, Japan really has no oil. You know, there may be a few drops of oil that Japan produces, but it imports all of its oil. It did then and it does today. And so uh, a good case can be made that this sort of uh, belligerence toward Japan in the years before the war uh, contributed toward their aggression, toward their uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, um, uh, if, if nothing else. And that's the sort of thing that Mises is talking about here. And of course, when he's doing the writing, it's, uh, it's in the, the middle of World War II. So he has already observed this. Uh, one interesting thing uh, that, um, that Mises talks about here is he, he mentions how uh, the United Nations is futile. Uh, it, it's really kind of entertaining that, to read what he has to say about such things as relying on international organizations. It's interesting to me because uh, if you, I just taught another online course on the road to serfdom, and Hayek, uh, Mises' student, uh, was not so critical. He says in the road to serfdom, yes, something like the United Nations can be turned into a, a very bad organization, very counterproductive, e even leading to more conflict and not less conflict. He's not, he's not a dreamer in that regard. But he does say, he does in the last chapter and two chapters, that uh, something like the, the League of Nations or the United Nations, but on a smaller scale, would be desirable. So that's one, one big difference uh, on this issue between Mises and Hayek, the two uh, most famous Austrians in addition to Rothbard. Uh, is that Hayek had some kind of faith that some international organization could be conducive to peace, whereas, whereas Mises uh, thought that no laissez-faire was the, the most important thing and that uh, really no good could come of the United Nations as far as that goes. Okay. Um, I think I was saying futile. Somebody says futile or futile here. Um, 
Another question, uh, Mises was writing in the middle of World War II, and he, he had to know that uh, the United States and, uh, and the other allies were practicing uh, what came to be known as war socialism. Uh, we'll get into this later in the course when we talk about what actually happened in the prosecution of World War I and World War II, uh, or the American Civil War for that matter, in that uh, some industries were nationalized uh, in what is socialism but uh, the government ownership of the means of production, and all industries were very heavily regulated and controlled. Now in the United States, the New Deal itself already had imposed a lot of regulation and control especially in labor markets of industry. But uh, World War II, which is the time Mises is writing this, these articles that I put on the, on the, the reading list, is where uh, they imposed all sorts of price controls, for example. And you don't need to have government ownership of the means of production to have socialism. Uh, Mises would say that an economy uh, that was so pervasively controlled like it was in World War II with pervasive price controls is socialism, war socialism. Uh, and of course the capital markets were greatly uh, 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 interfered with also. The government uh, had established the Reconstruction Finance Corporation under Herbert Hoover and the government was in the, uh, in the business of uh, making many tens of billions of dollars of loans for government directed purposes, including war purposes eventually. So government was controlling capital markets in a very large degree uh, and capital markets are the heart of capitalism after all. And so uh, uh, he asked the question, does war require socialism? And on the kind of price controls, of course, the basic eco economic lesson about price controls is that uh, if you impo impose price ceilings, uh, prices below market prices, you create shortages. Uh, there was some of that. A lot of the things the government wanted to buy, it just set arbitrary prices that were probably lower than what the free market would have chosen. And one end result of that was that there were shortages, that the government created shortages of, this, of these things by taking some of the profit out of, the, out of these items. Uh, but at the same time, there were price floors on a lot of things, if you will. That is, prices that were arbitrarily set above what market prices would be. And this was simply because of the lobbying clout of various defense contractors. Uh, they're selling their, their goods to the government, so why not sell them at the highest price they can ask for? Uh, it reminds me of an old man in his 90s I met once when I lived in Tennessee. He told me he had, an, uh, he had a, uh, a degree in agricultural economics, but he had been uh, for his whole life, in his business life, he was a businessman, uh, a road paver. He's in the business of paving roads for, for state and local governments uh, beginning in the 1920s. And I asked him how he got into that business, and he said he decided as a young man that that was one business where you could name your price because the government had no idea what it cost typically in, in Tennessee where he was living to, to pave roads. And a lot of that uh, is true about uh, the wars, World War One and World War II. Uh, the government had no idea what it cost uh, or what a market price would be. They didn't allow market prices to exist on these things. And of course the free market wouldn't create uh, tanks and and bazookas and things like this uh, in, in the, uh, if we didn't have uh, wars. And so uh, a lot of the prices, once markets were established in some of these things, uh, not just uh, weaponry, but all everything else, you know, an army uses everything that human beings use, clothing, food, shelter, and so forth. Uh, a lot of defense contractors made out with uh, monopolistic sweetheart deals. Among the things governments did also was to uh, outlaw uh, uh, competitive bidding in a lot of areas. And so a lot of these companies to this day uh, are still thriving from this, this system that was essentially created in World War I and then expanded in World War II of defense contracting as sort of a monopoly game between the U.S. government and maybe a dozen or, or so uh, uh, big companies that are the defense contractors. Okay. And so uh, of course, the case that uh, uh, war requires socialism, uh, the answer would be would be no. Mises makes the case that uh, if you are going to fight a defensive war, the best thing to do is to rely on capitalism as much as possible to, to produce the goods and services needed for the war. But then he makes the argument that war and the preservation of the market economy are inherently incompatible 
Uh, this is based not only on the fact that war inevitably leads to uh, central planning, a much, much higher degree of central planning, but he says that capitalism is so good at producing everything, including weapons of mass destruction, that if war goes on long enough, it could produce weapons that could destroy us all. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure he was thinking of nuclear weapons that could blow up the world. And so he says, yeah, well, yes, you want to rely on capitalism to produce things in a defensive war to save yourself from being conquered by, by a tyrant. But uh, there's a catch-22 here that capitalism is so good at producing things it can produce weapons that could be misused and destroy us all. And uh, that's kind of a, uh, an interesting uh, take on, on this. Um, an important thing to understand about the European wars uh, of the 20th century and the 19th century for that, um, for that matter is that uh, these were all uh, prosecuted by socialists of one degree or another. Fascists were socialists. Uh, after all, the word Nazi means national socialism. Uh, all of the all of the social the fascists uh, started out as socialists, as Marxists of one variety or another. Benito Mussolini was a, a Marxist political philosopher uh, and an academic before he became a politician. And so, one of the things uh, that these uh, 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 warmongers all believed in was autarky. Spelled A U T A T A R K Y, autarky, and autarky is uh, essentially the goal of autarky is self-sufficiency, economic self-sufficiency. That is, it's the, the denial of the international division of labor as a virtuous thing and as a, a means to prosperity. Uh, they wanted to produce everything themselves, but of course, the big problem is uh, Europe, especially in Europe. Uh, Europe did not have uh, uh, the natural resources that America had, that Russia had, that other parts of the world have. And so with, uh, with Germany in particular, if they wanted to follow a policy of autarky, which Hitler did, uh, that meant that a lot of things that they needed for their society and for their war machine had to be taken by conquest. By definition, they didn't have them. If they're denying free trade and they want to be uh, uh, practicing autarky, the only other way to get all these items is, is conquest. And so the, the folly of ignoring the international division of labor, of repudiating the international division of labor, uh, which Adam Smith explained the benefits of so eloquently in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, was the heart of the cause of the European wars and, and of the belligerency of Japan as well, in, uh, according to von Mises. And of course, as I said earlier, Japan uh, uh, its big problem was oil. It produced no oil. And if it wanted to be an imperial empire, it needed to conquer people who had oil. It didn't want to trade with them. It wanted to conquer them. And that was the, the heart of it. And that is in sharp contrast to the Manchester philosophy. And, and I think it's worth it taking uh, a minute for me to read uh, one paragraph from Human Action on page 827 of the Scholar's Edition. Uh, I think it's the same page on the web the web uh, article uh, about uh, on the futility of war in this chapter of human action uh, because this is just one of my favorite uh, quotes from human action where Misi says what distinguishes man from animals is the insight into the advantages that can be derived from cooperation under the division of labor man curbs his innate instinct of aggression in order to cooperate with other human beings the more he wants to improve his material well-being, the more he must expand the system of the division of labor. Concomitantly, he must more and more restrict the sphere in which he resorts to military action. The emergence of the international division of labor requires the total abolition of war. Such is the essence of the laissez-faire philosophy of Manchester. And that really says it in, uh, in a nutshell. And if you think of what happened in Mises' time, um, the capitalism was developing all around the world. The, the era after the American Civil War, the post-1865 era, is called the Second Industrial Revolution by economic historians. And by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, slavery was gone everywhere, free labor prevailed, there were government interventions in labor markets, but there was nothing like slavery, international trade, uh, was thriving. 
so that uh, a man or a woman in England uh, going about their daily routine, getting up in the morning, having breakfast, going to work, uh, would consume products that were produced from across the oceans and all throughout Europe. There was that much international trade, and there was peace. World War I shattered all of that. World War, World War I put an end to the international division of labor during the war, and it never really picked up again until after World War II until 1945, the latter part of 1945. So we had this period of world history from basically uh, 19, 1914, 1915, uh, 30 years of major disruption in the international division of labor because of all the interventionism that had preceded it, which led to war. Uh, it was the interventionism and the, the ideas of socialism and autarky that, uh, that led to the wars, to World War I and World War II, in Mises' view. And, and I agree with him. I think, I think he's dead right uh, about that. So that was the, the philosophy of the Manchester School, so-called, the, the, the great British libertarians. And the point that is made there is that economic nationalism harms other countries. Trade restrictions harm other countries. And if you put enough restrictions on trade in the International Division of Labor, uh, you can impoverish some countries. And that's what sort of backs them into a corner and leads to, leads to, uh, to war. As Bastiat said, if goods can't cross borders, armies will. Okay. So Europe, Europe was a special uh, case. I mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago because of the, the relative scarcity of natural resources, even water. Uh, I don't know, some of you might be Europeans that are in the class. We had somebody in my last class from Australia. Uh, but they never had the plentiful water resources in much of Central Europe, for example, that uh, the Americans are, are used to. And so uh, uh, Europeans were especially dependent on international trade. And that's why uh, the rise of interventionism was especially harmful. And, uh, and not only uh, interference with trade, but the bureaucratization of society. Uh, the, the growth of government interventionism domestically because government bureaucrats uh, are not suited to participating in the international division of labor and the freedom of exchange. That takes entrepreneurs. That takes entrepreneurship. And private sector entrepreneurship is, is just the opposite of government bureaucracy. Uh, a great example of, uh, of what entrepreneurship in the service of uh, the international division of labor is all about is, uh, is on display in an article that Lou Rockwell wrote shortly after 9-11. And I can't recall the title right now, but Grayson is quite the genius about this. But if the article was about uh, what all the people in the World Trade Center towers in New York City were doing uh, when, the, when they were bombed and all those people were killed uh, by, the, uh, by the terrorists who flew the airplanes in, into the, uh, the Twin Towers. Uh, well, you know, a lot of it was the banking industry, Citibank and other banks. What were these people doing there? Uh, some of them, a lot of them, were in the process of uh, clearing credit card transactions. So you had a man in California who went online to buy a carpet from an Indian carpet maker in, uh, in Delhi, in New Delhi. And so uh, he paid by credit card online, and he's going to have his carpet his handmade carpet shipped from India to California. And who's doing the transaction? Well, it's the banker who works for Citibank in the World Trade Center Towers in New York City. And so a great many of these people were facilitating international trade, uh, assisting the International Division of Labor. That's why the, uh, the terrorists who, uh, who launched those airplanes knew exactly what they were doing. They wanted to inflict uh, the maximum possible economic damage on, on America, and they did inflict a great deal of damage. But, uh, but that's what Mises is talking about here in his historical context. And, uh, and Grayson will probably find that article eventually. If not, I'll find it and post it eventually. But it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful article by Lee Rockwell on the, uh, the, the real purpose of free trade and what we lost when we lost all of that. And of course, one of the reasons why it was such a big loss is that these are people who have accumulated what economists call human capital in facilitating international trade. Uh, you know, most people just can't walk in there and, and instantly become experts in doing all these jobs that are done. 
and, uh, and you can't walk in there and be a successful entrepreneur necessarily without uh, a good bill of uh, education and training and experience in international entrepreneurship. And so the point Mises is making here is that as European societies became more and more government controlled, more and more bureaucratized, and government became a bigger and bigger part of the total economy, uh, that meant they were participating less and less in the international division of labor and, and international trade. And that's a bad thing. That's, that led, uh, you know, you combine that with the belief in autarky, and uh, that's a recipe for war. Okay. And that was the goal of all socialists, as Mises said, was autarky. Uh, the Bos I put the Bastiat article on the reading list here, uh, because it's, it's sort of a classic statement by, by Bastiat of uh, uh, why war? Why do we have war? And what he's referring to is he's paraphrasing in this article uh, Franz Oppenheimer in a book entitled The States by Franz Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was a sociologist. Uh, he lived in America. He died around 1950 or the 1950s, I think. And he wrote this book, The State. And one of the things he's uh, known for in this book is uh, clearly spelling out how there are really only two ways uh, to, to make money uh, legally. Uh, one is by entrepreneurship, buying or uh, providing goods and services for your fellow man and selling them on the open market. And two is uh, the second way is using the state somehow, some way to transfer resources from your fellow man to you in return for nothing. Uh, and you can do that through lobbying and politicking for special favors, for subsidies, for laws that benefit your company at the expense of your competitors, for protectionism. You can also do it through war. Uh, you can also have nations uh, uh, engaging in wars of conquest and gaining, uh, gaining their riches that way. And that's what Bastiat, I think, is referring to here. Uh, he's referring to the same literature that Franz Oppenheimer referred to. Franz Oppenheimer was a, a 20th century writer. Bastiat died in 1850, but uh, Oppenheimer's book, The State, is a historical book about the origins of the state um, and its functions uh, throughout, throughout history. And uh, one of the themes we're going to be talking about on several occasions in this course is how war always destroys wealth. Uh, Bastiat mentions this. And one of the ways in which war destroys wealth is that it diverts the whole process of savings and capital accumulation, savings that finances capital, capital accumulation, uh, where capital is used to produce goods and services for which there is a consumer demand, that capital is diverted uh, for destructive purposes, to blow things up, to kill people, to destroy things. Uh, many of you have probably read or even seen the television shows about what happened at the end of uh, World War II with all those American tanks and jeeps and trucks and, and equipment uh, over there. They didn't bring it back. Uh, uh, in many cases, they, they if they were anywhere near the sea, they would push them over cliffs into the sea or just, just abandon them there. And so, you know, think of the tremendous diversion of capital away from purposes that would, that would serve the interests of the society, the citizens, the consumers in the long run for years and years to come by producing goods and services. It's just lost forever because they were literally blown up or destroyed at the end. And it always takes a society years to catch up to the path of economic growth it would have been on had it not destroyed all that capital because the main ingredient in productivity growth is capital investment. It makes workers more productive if they have better tools, better machinery to work with, uh, and, and so forth. And, and so uh, when, you, when you have a war, you sacrifice many years of that. The American Civil War, for example, there are some economists who think that it took the South an entire century to catch up uh, to the economic growth path uh, of where it would have been had there not, not been a war and had we ended slavery peacefully instead uh, during the 1860s. Uh, even if they're off by multiple two, 50 years is still a long time to have a, a sort of a per permanently lowered growth path in terms of the growth of personal income uh, as a result of a war. And the same thing happened in the North. The North was harmed also by the diversion of all that capital for war as opposed to the consumer society. And it took the, uh, the North many, many years to catch up just as it did uh, the South. Okay. Um, 
uh, Basquiat hints at just war at the end of his, uh, in his talk. And of course, um, uh, Rothbard, uh, I put an article by Rothbard on there on a theory of just war. And, uh, and he talks about a just war basically as being a defensive war. And, and Mises, of course, uh, was no anarcho-capitalist. Anarcho uh, he believes in defensive wars. He believes in limited government. Uh, Rothbard uh, couldn't bring himself. He did at one time as a young man. Rothbard was a limited government conservative type, uh, but he eventually uh, believed it was uh, theoretically inconsistent of him uh, to believe in limited government because uh, government is never limited. Uh, and history seems to prove him right. <clears throat> but Mises uh, had a different opinion. Who knows, had Mises lived longer, he might have changed his mind about this. But, uh, but Rothbard on just war essentially defines it. Uh, uh, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas was among the first to theorize about what a, constitutes a just war. So just war theory has been around for a very, very uh, long time. And that's basically a defensive war. Uh, Mises himself mentioned uh, uh, Gro Grotius. I'm not sure that's how to pronounce his name. Maybe it's Grotius. But he was a, a Dutch philosopher who wrote several hundred years ago about the laws of warfare in a civilized society and international law of war, in other words. And basically what it said was that uh, all wars uh, will inevitably harm civilians as well as combatants, but it is a crime, a war crime, to intentionally target civilians, uh, to steal their property uh, in excess of what is needed to sustain the army. So what the people in the, uh, the just war theorists were saying and the international law theorists were saying uh, by the time you get to the mid-19th century is that uh, it's legitimate for a war, for an army, to, uh, to steal property, to steal food, for example, to feed itself, but that's it. Uh, no more. That's what they said. That was the rules of warfare that were taught at West Point by the Union Army generals. General Henry Halleck uh, literally wrote the book on uh, international law that was used at West Point to teach uh, many of the soldiers, and he taught many of the soldiers who fought in the American Civil War on the northern side and the southern side. That's what he taught them. That was the existing international law of warfare at the time, is that it's not legitimate to target civilians, and it's not legitimate to steal their personal property uh, other than what is necessary to sustain uh, the food uh, for the army. Uh, Rothbard touches upon a, a an important thing here where, where for many, many years the idea of neutrality in other people's wars was thought to be a virtuous thing. Uh, some of you have probably heard of or read uh, George Washington's and Thomas Jefferson's philosophy of war and foreign affairs. Uh, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson was opposed to having uh, any, anything more than a very, very tiny diplomatic presence anywhere. And uh, their basic philosophy was uh, entangling alliances with no other countries but commercial relationships with all. And so if other people have conflicts, uh, it's none of our business, was the American foreign policy really up until uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson's day in, in the 20th century. Uh, or maybe I should say uh, until the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War was sort of a, a sneak preview of the 20th century. So the late 19th century, the Spanish-American War, that's why I put on the, on the reading list, by the way, uh, the article by uh, William Graham Sumner about um, Spain's conquest of America. Uh, what, what was conquered was uh, the Jeffersonian, George Washington idea of foreign policy that uh, we should have commercial relationships with all nations, but entangling alliances with none, stay out of the feuds of the old continent of Europe is what they, they wanted to do. It can only mean a loss of American blood and treasure for, uh, for no good. Uh, and, but that changed. That all changed. And I would argue it changed beginning with the American Civil War, not in the Civil War, but in the, in the years right after the Civil War, uh, because of the, uh, the popularity of one phrase from the Declaration of Independence. When Lincoln uh, made the Gettysburg Address and he quoted Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence saying, all men are created equal. Uh, well, we'll talk later about how Lincoln himself did not believe this, but he, he said this uh, there. That was taken after the war, in the years after the war. Uh, that was taken as the meaning of the Declaration of Independence. 
even though if you read the full Declaration of Independence, especially the last several paragraphs, uh, you see that it really was a declaration of secession or separation from the British Empire. It says in the last uh, several paragraphs that each state is free and independent. It says that uh, the state of Massachusetts is a free and independent state, just like England, Spain, and France are free and independent states. And it says, uh, what does this mean? It says that they are free to raise taxes and conduct wars, just like England or France or Spain can. And these are the states, not the United States, but uh, the state. And so that's, you know, that, that was the origins of, of the American Republic. But this all changed. This all changed with um, the theory of uh, uh, equality that was ushered in by Lincoln, because uh, not Lincoln and his and his political compatriots, but the next generation took this to mean, well, Americans uh, have a special role in the world to guarantee that all people everywhere are equal and have equal freedom, equal democracy, like us. And this uh, morphed into what, by Woodrow Wilson's time, was called the theory of collective security. That it was just the opposite of the George Washington, Thomas Jefferson theory of foreign policy, of, of commercial relationships with all entangling alliances with none. It meant, uh, well, commercial relationships with all is OK, but entangling alliances with everyone uh, is what it, is what it has turned into today, and this began with with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, because Lincoln became so deified, and he became the symbol of the American state. Uh, the advocates of imperialism took this as being the new mantra, the new philosophy of foreign policy, and so uh, Americans took it as their, not all Americans, but the Americans who run the foreign policy establishment took it as their imperative to impose democracy all around the world. Uh, when, when Teddy Roosevelt orchestrated the killing of some 200,000 Filipinos because the Filipinos resisted uh, becoming a part of the American empire after they had thrown off the Spanish empire, uh, he invoked Abe Lincoln. He invoked this idea of, of forcing people to be free like us and have democracy like us. And so, uh, Rothbard uh, quotes Isabel Patterson, uh, the great libertarian author Isabel Patterson, who uh, coined the phrase uh, to describe people like Woodrow Wilson as humanitarians with a, with a guillotine. Uh, they claim to be humanitarians, but what do they do? They go and wage wars in foreign countries and kill people by the thousands or the hundreds of thousands, supposedly to make them free. And so that's, that's what he's talking about when he mentions Isabel Patterson. And Rothbard's position, which is also my position, is that if other countries have trouble with tyrants and tyranny, that's their problem. Uh, if Iraq had a problem with Saddam Hussein, that's their problem, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. And Murray would have agreed 100% uh, uh, with that. Uh, yes, it would be nice if people all over the world had natural rights to life, liberty, and property protected by their government rather than ruined by their government. Uh, but nothing good can come of uh, foreign policy interventionism on our part, uh, is, is Rothbard's thinking here. And, uh, and he makes a good case. Now, in talking about uh, just, uh, just war, Rothbard talks about the, the title, uh, the original title of this article was Two Just Wars. Uh, and he considers the American Revolution and the war between the states uh, to be two just wars. And, but he means the southern side of the war between the states as being a just war uh, because he sees this as a defensive war against uh, a government that wanted to impose its will on people who did not consent to having that will imposed upon them. And uh, he begins talking with the revolution. And uh, it really is important to integrate history and economics like Rothbard does here to really understand these things. That's why I love his writing so much, uh, not on, only on war, but everything. Uh, is that uh, he really shed so much light uh, with his great understanding of economics and the economic world and, and how it can help explain things like war. But the revolution uh, was, was rel relatively new in the world because it established that the people were sovereign, not the king uh, or not the government. We didn't have a king, but we had a, a central government and local governments. And this was a relatively new thing that we didn't call the king. We didn't have a king and we didn't call him sovereign. Uh, it was the, the people were sovereign, 
And of course, the idea originally was that the people of the respective states uh, were, were sovereign. And when they created the central government to serve as their agents, mostly for foreign policy and uh, war making purposes, defensive war making purposes, primarily, uh, the state, the central state was to act as their agent, the agent of the people of the, the sovereign states. That was the idea. Uh, and so the 13 sovereign states were created by the revolution. And uh, if you read the, uh, the Treaty of Paris that was used, uh, you know, that concluded the Revolutionary War, uh, King George III of Great Britain very clearly uh, says in there that he's making a treaty with all the individual states, and he named them one by one, uh, uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Providence, uh, Providence Plantations, and so forth. He names each individual state. He did not make a treaty with something called the United States government. He made a treaty with each individual state because that's who was deemed to be sovereign at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. And so, uh, so Rothbard concludes that the Revolution was certainly a just war from the side perspective of the Americans who revolted against having British mercantilism imposed on them and being plundered and being essentially uh, tax slaves. The King of Great Britain, that after all, that's what colonies were for, weren't they? Uh, as far as uh, the British Empire uh, is, is concerned. And so then comes the Civil War. Rothbard makes the case that the South in the Civil War uh, was fighting a just war and uh, because the, the, the federal government, the central government, was invading it. Now, if you were to go, uh, go online and look up the U.S. Constitution and uh, see what it says about treason, it's, it's defined in Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. And it says, treason against the United States shall consist of waging war against them, in the plural, them, or giving aid and comfort to their enemies. And so in all the founding documents, Articles of Confederation, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, the words United States are always in the plural, signifying that the free and independent states are united for some purpose. Uh, there. And so uh, treason meant waging war against them, the individual states. And so uh, by definition, uh, when, when Lincoln invaded the southern states, that was the Constitution's definition of treason, waging war against the states. And so that was, that was by definition an act of treason uh, in, in, in doing so. Uh, it's very clear there. But Lincoln himself redefined treason to essentially mean criticism or opposition to him and his administration. In one of my books, I actually cite Lincoln from his own collected papers as saying at one point that uh, if the war and the, and the policy of the government is being discussed publicly and a man stands around and is silent and says nothing about it, that's treasonous because he does not defend the Lincoln administration. And so somehow the idea of treason uh, was twisted into meaning criticism of the government rather than waging war on the states which is what it says in the Constitution. And uh, this had to have been something that persuaded uh, Rothbard to make the case that it was a southern secession and fighting off the, uh, the northern invaders who wanted to force them into the Union was, was a just war. Of course, the Union was originally a, uh, a, uh, a, a voluntary Union. Article 7 of the Constitution says that the Union will be ratified by the states. And of course, uh, 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 New York and Rhode Island and North Carolina kind of dragged their feet. Uh, North Carolina was out of the Union for quite a long time, over a year after it, the Constitution was ratified because the Constitution only required nine of the 13 states uh, for ratification. And no one thought uh, that uh, North Carolina or Rhode Island should be invaded and forced into the Union. It was a voluntary Union. Uh, uh, and that all ended uh, with the, the Civil War. The Union was no longer voluntary. So, so I would argue, and Murray Rothbard would argue, that the voluntary Union of the Founding Fathers was destroyed by the Civil, Civil War. It was no longer voluntary. It was held together at, uh, at gunpoint at that time. And in one of my articles on uh, lewrockwell.com entitled Happy Secession Day, I cite Thomas Jefferson from some letters that he wrote to uh, various people uh, when he was president and after, uh, who asked him, well, what would happen if, um, if the United States split up into several confederacies? And he essentially said that uh, they would all be our children, and I would wish them all well. He said he would God bless them all. 
uh, and they would all be Americans. Uh, and so uh, Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Secession, Declaration of Independence, was a declaration of secession from the British Empire, uh, even later on in life was in favor of peaceful secession, which uh, he thought would be a good thing. Uh, it would be, they would all be our children, he said. Uh, and, and Murray Rothbard knew this. Murray Rothbard knew this. He read everything. Uh, the tariff. Rothbard mentions the role of the tariff in creating the, uh, the war. Uh, all you have to do is read Lincoln's first inaugural address, which of course is online. And the first part of it is what I call his slavery forever speech, where he says he had no intention of, di of disturbing southern slavery, and even if he did, it would be unconstitutional to do so. He says, read any of my past speeches. I've always said this. Uh, and then he also endorses a constitutional amendment that would have prohibited the government from ever interfering in Southern slavery. It was called the Corwin Amendment, C-O-R-W-I-N, named after a member of Congress. And Lincoln himself actually orchestrated this. He instructed William Seward, his, his future Secretary of State, uh, before Inauguration Day to get this amendment through the Senate, which Seward did. And so uh, when, when Abe Lincoln was inaugurated, the House and the Senate had passed this Corwin Amendment that would have uh, it's spelled C-O-R-W-I-N. If, uh, if you Google it, there's a Wikipedia entry on the Corwin Amendment uh, out there. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, uh, on the day he was inaugurated, Lincoln was willing to, uh, to uh, enshrine slavery in the Constitution, which would, uh, and he said also, that it would probably last into the 20th century. Uh, he was willing to do that to keep the Union together, but in the same speech, he says, it is my duty to collect the duties and imposts, tariffs. And two days earlier, on March 2nd, 1861, uh, President Buchanan had signed the Morrill Tariff Bill, spelled M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, after uh, a congressman, uh, Justin Morrill of Vermont, that uh, increased the average tariff rate from 15%, 1.5, to about 33%. And so it had more than doubled the average tariff rate, the average tax. And in his first inaugural address, Abe Lincoln said, there, there needs to be no, there will be no invasion or bloodshed in any state. Invasion and bloodshed. He, he's threatening war. That's, that's a threat of war. Invasion and bloodshed. Over what? The very next sentence is where he says, it is my duty to collect the duties and imposts. So it is literally a threat of war over tax collection which is why, and Rothbard, of course, knew this. He had read this. And, and that's why he says that, uh, uh, that's one reason why Rothbard said that the tariff was a contributing cause of the war, not the only cause. No, no war has just one cause, whether it's slavery or anything else. But that certainly is one important cause. And it's right there in black and white in Lincoln's first inaugural address. And of course, the North and the South had been battling over tariff policy for 30 years at this time. South Carolina almost seceded over the 1828 tariff, it was called the Tariff of Abominations, that put an average tariff rate of 45% uh, on, on imports. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, the Civil War that Rothbard talks about, he mentions briefly, is uh, uh, all throughout the North, uh, there had been uh, 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 something that had been very, become very popular that's known as post-millennialism, a religious belief of post-millennialism. Uh, it was a particular brand of post-millennialism. There are people today who call themselves post-millennialists, but they don't necessarily agree with the people of the mid-19th century and what that means. But in the mid-19th century, the idea was in order for the second coming of Jesus Christ to occur, uh, man had to create a thousand-year kingdom of God on earth. And that meant the elimination of sin, especially the sin of slavery, Catholicism, and alcoholism. So, so the, 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 uh, the so-called Yankees were infatuated with post-millennialism and prohibitionism, Catholicism were the big enemies, as was, of course, slavery. And so the opposition to slavery was not motivated so much in the minds of these people by concern for the plight of the poor slaves. It was concern over their own salvation, which they thought uh, had to be uh, gotten by immediately eliminating slavery, and not eliminating slavery, by the way, in the way they had eliminated slavery in the northern states. 
uh, in the northern states, uh, including New York, for example, slavery was eliminated very gradually. They started passing what were called gradual emancipation laws in the, in the late 1790s. And there were still slaves in New York City in 1853. Uh, that's how they ended slavery, but they were not willing to allow the southern states to uh, go on the same path, even if gradual eman emancipation meant four years or five years and not 50 years like they did. Uh, England, once it decided it was going to do this, only took five or six years to eliminate slavery in the British Empire, throughout the British Empire. And so uh, that's what Rothbard is talking about here when he talks about these people. Uh, glory, read the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 650,000 dead people, the bombing and burning of cities. Uh, that's what they call the coming of the glory of the Lord because uh, that was their post-millennialist belief. And so uh, Rothbard puts a great uh, deal of credence in the, in the idea that uh, this is why the only country in the world to end slavery with a war in the 19th century was America. The British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the French, the Dutch, the Danes, the Swedes, all had slaves. They all ended slavery. In fact, uh, of all the slaves that were brought to the Western Hemisphere, only about 5% ended up in the U.S. 95% were the Caribbean, South America, West Indies, uh, part of different empires. And, and it was mostly, with the exception of Haiti, there was a, a slave revolt in 1798, and it took several more years to end slavery in Haiti against uh, the French. Uh, but everybody else, including the northern states, including Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Rhode Island, they ended slavery peacefully there. Uh, another thing uh, Rothbard talks about, which I've written about a lot in several books and a lot of other uh, uh, place, places, is uh, the Whig economic program. And the Whig economic program was protectionist tariffs, central bank, and corporate welfare. So. The, of course, protectionist tariffs are a form of corporate welfare, and what wasn't financed by the protectionist tariff revenue would have been financed by the central bank and the printing of money. That was the Whig economic program. It really came from Alexander Hamilton. He coined the phrase the American system, and Henry Clay carried this forward in the 1830s and 40s until his death in 1852, and then Abraham Lincoln picked this up. And, and uh, this had been battled over in politics for 70 years, and it was all put into place during the Lincoln administration. And so uh, Rothbard hints that this was really one of the main purposes of the war, is to finally put this into place. And of course, uh, the Union was made into a god, with a small g, after the war. But uh, prior to that, most Americans thought of the Union as just a practical, political thing uh, that was put together for mutual uh, defense purposes, primarily the, the armies and the navies to fend off and deter foreign aggressors. Uh, it wasn't some sort of mystical, magical thing that should be defended at all costs, including the death of some 650,000 Americans. Now, keep in mind, this is at a time when uh, the population of the country was about one-tenth of what it is today. So if you were to standardize for today's population, that would be as though six and a half million Americans were killed in a, in a, in a four-year war. Uh, and so uh, all save the, to turn the Union into a, a god of some kind. And of course, um, the laws of warfare that were taught at West Point by uh, Henry Halleck, who became General Henry Halleck in Lincoln's army, uh, that said that it is illegitimate and a crime, a war crime, to, uh, to intentionally target civilians. Uh, that was all swept aside in the American Civil War from the very beginning. Uh, a war was waged on civilians. Uh, General Sherman said it, he stated it, uh, so did Grant, that it was the, the population, not just the army, that had to be uh, invaded. Uh, and, and they did. Uh, uh, probably one of the, there's a book called The Hard Hand of War by uh, Mark Greeley uh, that talks not only about the American Civil War, but the waging of war on civilians and the waging of total war in a lot of other places in history, if anyone has the stomach for it. There's also another book called Waging War on Southern Civilians by Brian Walter Brian Sisco, C-I-S-C-O. And uh, it's, it's based on uh, the military records uh, from uh, the official record of the Civil War that is kept by the U.S. government. It's all the documents uh, from both sides of the war that are all put together in a, 
multi-volume set. All the big university libraries have the official records. If you're a Civil War researcher, that's what you rely on. And Walter Sisko uh, wrote a book on uh, documenting the, the waging of war on civilians. Uh, and, and again, you have to have a, a strong stomach to read these things. Uh, but that's what, what came of this, and, and that's why uh, Rothbard called it a just war, because they were fighting against uh, these things. Uh, and he, he obviously doesn't buy into the idea that uh, the North was fighting to end slavery. Uh, if they were, uh, Murray would, would be in favor of it. That would be a just war in Murray's definition, uh, uh, if that's what uh, was being done. But of course, Lincoln uh, famously wrote a letter to Horace Greeley, the newspaper man, uh, uh, where, he, where Greeley had asked him, what is the purpose of this war anyway? And Lincoln said his ultimate purpose has always been to save the Union. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, if I can do it without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could do it by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would do that also. But saving the Union is, is the, uh, the primary goal. And of course, I argued and others have that uh, the Union wasn't saved. Uh, the voluntary Union was destroyed by, by the war. And so, uh, and so it's important as we go along in the course uh, to understand, read this article about just war, uh, and keep it in the back of your mind as we go. We'll be talking about other wars and other conflicts, and but that's a particular piece of American history that I think is very, very important. And I see it's 8.18. I've been talking a little longer, I guess, uh, than I, than I uh, planned, but um, I'll be glad to take some questions now, uh, and I'll, I'll start lead, uh, reading through some of the chat here. And Grayson can intervene if there's someplace else. I'll, uh, I can look for the question somewhere else. But I'll start. Uh, but feel free to go ahead and ask any question. Uh, I'll give my, my best effort to, uh, to answer it. Paul says, we're still living under Whig economics. Uh, yes, we are. <laughs> that's true. Uh, 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 that's. Um, my latest book is called Hamilton's Curse, and, and Alexander Hamilton was really the inventor, the, the first proponent of this system, of essentially um, bringing British mercantilism to America. They had just fought a war against uh, the British Empire, and because the American colonists were being victimized by this British mercantilist system with the Stamp Act and the, Na the Navigation Acts, that uh, impeded free trade of the colonists, the Tea Acts, which put special taxes on tea and, and other things. Uh, uh, that's what they were fighting the war against. And then after the war, there was a group of people in American politics led by such people as Hamilton, who had the opinion that, uh, well, yes, uh, an empire uh, with colonies is a bad thing if you're a colony. But if you're in charge of the empire, it's a good thing. If you're on the tax collecting side of the empire, it can be a good thing. And they wanted to be on the tax collecting end, not the paying end. And so they advocated essentially a, a central bank modeled after the Bank of England, corporate welfare, high protectionist tariffs uh, that Adam Smith had railed against in the wealth of nation. And uh, they had very little success for a long time. This became the Whig program by the 1830s. Uh, and then uh, the Republicans picked up the mantle in the 1850s and the 1860s and we, it was all put into place, the railroad subsidies, corporate welfare on a very massive scale, uh, the National Currency Acts during the Civil War years greatly uh, nationalized and, and centralized uh, government control of the money supply, the Legal Tender Acts also occurred, and protectionist tariffs. The average tariff rate before the Civil War was 15 percent, one five. From the Civil War until 1913, when the income tax came in, the average tariff rate was 45 to 50 percent. And so the WIG program was all put into place, and we've been just expanding on it ever since then. Uh, here are a few questions. Let's see. Uh, uh, Andrew wants to know, do I feel like I'm the only, <laughs> the only sane historian? I'm shocked with some of the things you have taught me. It's, uh, it's out of control. Uh, no, uh, well, Robert Higgs uh, uh, is also quite sane, uh, especially for this course. I put a lot of articles by Robert Higgs. Tom Woods is a great historian who, uh, uh, and as far as sane goes, uh, maybe I'll put up, or I'll get Grayson to put up eventually, uh, what Rothbard had to say about the study of history and, and human action. Uh, he makes the case that uh, 
historians, and Rothbard has made this case too. I'll find these articles in, in book chapters. Rothbard has made the case that uh, historians are basically ad hoc. When they write uh, their books, they basically gather together a lot of facts, and they don't always have any, any guiding philosophy or, 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 or way of thinking. That's what economics gives you. It gives you a way of thinking that is unique and, and very, very powerful. I'm not saying it's the only way of thinking about history, but it's a very unique and very powerful and important way of, of understanding historical events. Not all historical events, but certainly something like war. And so uh, uh, Mises made the case uh, that a lot of what's written about history is just so wrong and, and misleading, uh, not because it's intentionally misleading, but uh, the average historian who writes about such things as the role of the tariff in precipitating the Civil War really knows nothing about it. He knows nothing about tariffs or the economics of tariffs. And it doesn't take a lot. It's elementary economics, really. But they seem to be too lazy to even and do that. And, uh, you know, when we have the Austrian Scholars Conference at Auburn University, at uh, the Mises Institute in Auburn, every March, uh, we have 100 to 200 uh, academics, and many of them write on historical topics. And so there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, good historians out there on our side, so to speak. Um, Paul wants to know, do we have Hamilton to thank for everything that we have today? Well, no, not everything. Uh, or do you think that the corporatism we have today would have come about as a result of post-World War II American hegemony? Uh, well, uh, when I first started writing about Hamilton, I, I can recall getting an email from a, a law student at New York University thanking me for criticizing Hamilton because uh, his law professor there, Nadine Strassen, he's told me had been going day after day praising what was called the Hamiltonian interpretation of the Constitution which is essentially to say that there are implied powers of the Constitution uh, and that uh, the general welfare clause should be uh, uh, interpreted as broadly as possible, as should the Commerce Clause, so that government is basically unlimited in its powers. And of course, if you have a government that is unlimited in its powers and you have a system of pervasive government regulation with dozens or hundreds of government regulatory agencies that control every industry in America, you have a lot of instances of where the corporations themselves will not just sit back and be controlled, but will capture the regulatory agencies and be the controllers. Uh, they will influence politics. Back in the 19th century, when government was much smaller, there was hardly anyone to bribe. So uh, you, you had to make money the old-fashioned way by earning it on the marketplace. But today, there are so many infinitely more opportunities to make money by bribing politicians uh, to give you bailouts, to give you special subsidies, to harm your competitors, that, that, that there's so much more of that. And of course, Hamilton would, necessarily, would not necessarily be in favor of what happens today, but he did sow the seeds of both the constitutional destruction, because he thought the government was much too small and weak, even under the Constitution, which he called a frail and worthless fabric after it was ratified, and, and also the pervasive government regulation. And uh, Hamilton, by the way, was a a real busy body. William Graham Sumner wrote a biography of Hamilton where he said, uh, in effect, that uh, he could barely stand to keep his hands off of anything when it came to the economy. He wanted the government to have some influence over just about everything in the economy. Uh, he didn't really understand how markets work, how markets are the result of the spontaneous order created by the voluntary efforts of the thousands of individuals who participate in, in producing and creating and selling things and marketing things. He, he just didn't seem to understand that. He had the central planning mindset. So uh, that, that's what I'll say for now about uh, Hamilton. Let's see what else we have. Uh, so I speak a little bit on Woodrow Wilson and the progressive's approach to war. Uh, well, I did mention Wilson in passing. Uh, I mentioned that the, this idea of um, uh, all men are created equal was expanded to mean all men everywhere are created equal, meaning they deserve equal freedom. And, w and Wilson was uh, the, among the first to take this as meaning we had a right to invade any country where there was a conflict where we could make the case that uh, we, we are expanding other people's freedom, uh, whereas neutrality was the uh, uh, the main uh, way of thinking about foreign policy prior to that. But it really began with the Spanish-American War, uh, 
you know, with, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt's intervention in the Philippines and, and elsewhere, uh, but especially so with Wilson uh, there. And so it was the progressives who, uh, who uh, many of whom were uh, what Rothbard says were, were called pietists. They believed that they could use government to create heaven on earth. And uh, not only in America, uh, and, and by the time you get to the progressive era, the rallying cry was what, what they were against was uh, rum uh, and Romanism, first and foremost. Catholic Church and booze. Uh, those are the, the big enemies, Catholicism and, and booze. And, uh, and they wanted to create a perfect society. Uh, they want them, uh, how are they going to do that? They're going to create public schools and indoctrinate all the children to be good little Protestants, among others, because they were terrified by all the Catholic immigrants from Ireland and elsewhere that were coming into America at the time, especially coming into New England and the Boston and, and elsewhere, all these Irish Catholics. And so, uh, and also so prohibition, they're behind prohibition. And then that was expanded uh, from belief that the government could be used to, uh, to make the world, the, the country a perfect place, to make the world a perfect place. And so the progressives, we'll talk about this in a, in a couple of weeks, the progressives, uh, most of the major American progressives were in favor of World War I, although they were against their own personal participation. They were chicken hawks like Dick Cheney and all the rest, uh, and then William Bennett and all the neoconservatives, William Crystal, uh, you know, go down the list. They were chicken hawks. They were war advocates, but not for me, not for my son or daughter. Uh, you know, they're for, it's for you to participate in the war. And uh, one of the reasons they gave is that they thought the war would be a demonstration project for central planning and socialism, and that they could make the argument that uh, when we win the war, it proves that socialism and central planning works. Therefore, after the war, we can use socialism and central planning to, to plan the civil society, just like we plan uh, the military part of, part of things during the war. And so that's, that's what I'll say for now. We're going to talk about the progressives. I have several articles on them uh, later on in the course. Uh, next question by Dennis. Uh, my thoughts on the Tenth Amendment generally and as an aid in our fight against Leviathan. Uh, a little off the topic of war, I guess, but um, uh, Jefferson thought the Tenth Amendment was the cornerstone of the entire, uh, in the entire Constitution. Uh, he was, uh, the Constitution delegated certain powers to the, to the central government to act as the agent of the people of the states who were sovereign and everything else is left up to the people or, or the states under the Tenth Amendment. And that would include the right of secession because everyone naturally assumed that the people of the states were sovereign at the time. And so, uh, yes, if we, if we uh, if we were able to enforce the Tenth Amendment, uh, uh, that would certainly cut back on government, but uh, we cannot depend on the Supreme Court to ever do that. It's not in the self-interest of Supreme Court justices or any other federal judge to limit the powers of the federal government in any significant way. Uh, uh, Judge Napolitano in his book, uh, The Constitution in Exile, points out that uh, uh, the Supreme Court did not rule any federal law unconstitutional between 1937 and 1995. And so uh, the Supreme Court has turned into a rubber stamp for statism and has been for several generations now. In fact, that's how Alexander Hamilton always saw the Constitution. He saw it as a potential rubber stamp or, or a, a seal of good housekeeping for anything the government would ever want to do as long as it was properly interpreted by good, clever lawyers like himself. So his view of the Constitution was exactly the opposite of Jefferson, that the government needed to be bound by the change of the Constitution. So if the Tenth Amendment is ever to have meaning, it would have to have meaning by the people of the states organizing as states, nullifying federal laws or seceding and creating their own republics and saying, see you later to the federal government. Good luck. It's been fun. Uh, but other than that, you cannot rely on the government to limit its own power. I think if American history teaches us anything, it should teach us that. Um, Will Beasley says Woods is okay and he has a smiley face. That's, that's okay. Uh, links or, uh, from Jeremiah Dyke, suggested readings about the U.S. dumping their weaponry in the ocean. Uh, oh, I've seen videos of that. You could probably uh, search around on YouTube and look for uh, videos of that. Um, um, 
the person emailed Bob Higgs, Robert Higgs. Uh, he has a lot of articles on lourockwell.com and some on Mises.org. Uh, you can get his email address there. Uh, if anyone knows the specific articles about that, it would be Robert Higgs. And so uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head right now that uh, where I can give you a link. If I do, I'll, I'll put them on the, uh, the forum. Warren, after Vicksburg fell, were the Southern soldiers taken prisoners or were they allowed to go home? Um, well, soldiers that were captured on both sides uh, were often paroled. Some of them, are, of course, went into prison camps. There's the famous Anderson, uh, Andersonville prison camp in the south. There were many Andersonvilles in the north that were just as bad or worse in terms of uh, the, the degradation and the death. Uh, you know, to this day, if you go to some of these northern prison camps from the Civil War, there were there were hundreds and hundreds of graves in cemeteries nearby where the southern soldiers died there, just like they did in Andersonville, uh, South Carolina. Uh, um, the only Confederate ever to be hanged at the end of the war was uh, the commander of the Andersonville prison camp. But that's what happened uh, 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 with the Civil War. Uh, the prisoners were taken prisoner, but a lot of times they were, they were paroled and they ended up uh, fighting again, going back in the, into the Army. The Tenth Amendment, something for the uh, for the anti-war movement to apply. Well, yes, certainly. You know, we have a history of this. Um, the War of 1812, the New England Federalists did not participate. New England essentially seceded from the Union, in effect, by not participating in the War of 1812. Uh, in my book, Lincoln Unmasked, I, I quote uh, the legislatures of uh, New Hampshire, Connecticut, some of the New England states as quoting Jefferson, uh, not the Tenth Amendment, but the Kentucky Resolve of 1798, where he expresses the, the, the compact theory of, of the Union, saying that the states are sovereign and they have, a, they have an equal say on constitutionality along with the President and along with the Congress and along with the Supreme Court that has a say on constitutional matters. And the New England states said uh, uh, they didn't think the war was constitutional. They thought it was a dispute between Jefferson's party and, and Great Britain, uh, and is what they said anyway. And they didn't send soldiers. To, if uh, uh, They did such things as a, if a man was trying to be recruited, they would put him in debtor's prison. And then when the federal uh, uh, military people would leave, they would let him out of debtor's prison, things like that. So there is a history of uh, using the, the idea of nullification of an unconstitutional war to not participate, but that would take a governor to say, uh, you know, troops from this state, uh, National Guard troops from this state are going to stay here and guard the state and help us out here at home. They're not going to uh, uh, Timbuktu uh, in the name of uh, spreading democracy in, the, in Timbuktu. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lincoln and Republicans uh, supported the Homestead Act. Why did Southerners oppose it? Well, not all Southerners opposed it, and not all Northerners were in favor of it. But for many years um, prior to the Civil War, the South wanted the, the federal government claimed ownership of all this land. It still owns 60 percent of all the land west of the Mississippi, and <clears throat> Southerners wanted the government to sell the land to reduce pressure on protectionist tariffs. Uh, a lot of northern politicians wanted to give it away for free as a way of buying votes and political support. But you have to keep in mind, at the time the Civil War broke out, uh, federal tariff revenue was over 90% of all federal revenue. You can look this up on the web uh, if you find the, the great book on uh, the uh, uh, blockades, tariffs, and the Civil War by Mark Thornton and Robert Eakin. They have some nice charts on this. Uh, and, uh, but up to 95% of all federal revenue came from tariffs uh, in 1860, 90 to 95% every year. And so uh, <clears throat> in the South thought that they were disproportionately harmed by this because it was an agricultural society and most of the tariffs on imports were on imported manufactured goods. They protected northern manufacturers from competition uh, and everyone paid higher prices and the South saw no benefit in all costs to this. So they had been complaining about this for decades. And so they thought the sale of public lands, so-called, would take some of the political pressure off of raising tariff rates. They thought they could buy lower tariff rates 
with the sale of public lands, but the majority of northern politicians wanted to give the land away. And they ended up giving, by the way, giving most of it away to corporations, railroad corporations, timber companies, mining companies, got more than half of all the land that was given away during this era, especially the railroad corporations. Uh, the government subsidized railroad corporations. Not all of them. There was a privately funded transcontinental railroad, the Great Northern, uh, funded and, and run by James J. Hill. Uh, and uh, it's said that uh, one of the main characters in the famous novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand is modeled after James J. Hill. Okay, so that's that's what I'll have to say about that question. Uh, Paul says, when I took constitutional law in law school, we never read the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, the Constitution, and the standalone document. Uh, that should tell you what they're teaching in law school. Yes, you, you read case law. And uh, much of case law is essentially several generations of the Hamiltonian twisting of the words of the Constitution to essentially eviscerate the Constitution so that it has really no meaning at all as a, as a limitation on the state. That's why I mentioned earlier the law student from NYU who emailed me said, thank you for criticizing Hamilton, because there, you'll hear these words, the Hamiltonian interpretation of the law uh, in law schools, not all law schools, but, but you will in some, and that's what they mean. They mean uh, Ham it was Hamilton who invented the, uh, the idea of implied powers, for example, of the Constitution. He did this with his debate with Jefferson over the constitutionality of a central bank. Uh, um, Jefferson said the power to create a central bank is not in the Constitution. The Constitutional Convention debated this and rejected it. Hamilton responded by saying, but yes, but there are implied powers in the Constitution. And uh, it's been all downhill from there. Once you go down that road that there are implied or imaginary powers, then the powers of the government are only limited by the imaginations of the politicians and not limited by anything else. Okay. Um, Grayson, uh, since moderate intervention leads to greater intervention, do I think the Monroe Doctrine made the Roosevelt Corollary inevitable? Um, yeah, a good case can be made. Uh, Good case can be made for that. I think uh, I'm not the world's biggest expert on uh, the uh, unintended consequences or intended consequences of the Monroe Doctrine, but I think that's a good that's a good point. I think a good case can be made for that. That's sort of the necessian theory of interventionism. The one intervention leads inevitably to failures and conflict, uh, which government calls for more intervention. Just look at the uh, the boom and bust created by the Fed currently which led to immediate calls by the Fed to give it more powers. That's, that's the way the world works uh, with government. Um, then it's, are there any more signs of the reemergence of just war doctrine anywhere in the world? Uh, yes, Congressman Ron Paul uh, and his supporters, the, the whole Campaign for Liberty and uh, Students for Liberty, which is a student offshoot of this, they're all busy educating themselves in, in just war and the constitutionalism and free market Austrian economics. Uh, I've given several talks at conventions uh, held by the Campaign for Liberty. And as someone who's been a college professor for 30 years, it's thrilling to me to see all these young people uh, wanting to know the, these things because they want to make a difference. Not only have I met a lot of young people that are just educating themselves, but they're going out there knocking on doors for seven or eight hours at a time trying to persuade people to vote for uh, for uh, sort of like-minded people who are running in their in their neighborhoods and, and districts. And so uh, so there is, uh, who knows what will come of this, but it's, it's very invigorating to be around these people and to be around Ron Paul himself, of course. Uh, let's see. Uh, doesn't, uh, let's see doesn't paroling the Civil War POWs contradict the total war policy. Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, it was probably mostly a matter of, of uh, convenience. What do we do with these people? Uh, uh, should we spend resources feeding and taking care of them versus feeding and taking care of our own people, our own soldiers? Uh, so I think it was a pragmatic decision. But uh, total war, uh, southern cities were bombed. Uh, the bombing of Atlanta, for example, the Confederate Army had left. There were no soldiers there. 
And for, for several days, Sherman uh, used private homes as target practice. If they would see someone moving around inside a house, they would pick that house and shoot at it. 90% uh, of Atlanta was burned down. Uh, there were about 2,000 people left in the city after the bombing of Atlanta, and they were all kicked out of their homes and made homeless in November of 1864. Uh, with the onset of winter after two large armies had just passed through and eaten up everything and taken everything. Same thing happened in the Shenandoah Valley where there was no longer any Confederate army. Uh, uh, the people in the Shenandoah Valley to this day uh, refer to it as the burning. Uh, they burned down everything, homes, businesses, farms, uh, stole all the livestock and, and, and kicked the people out onto the road. Uh, that was total war. Uh, murdering civilians, uh, rape uh, was was undoubtedly rampant. That was total war. It was not so. I don't, I don't see any conflict. Usually, when they paroled the soldiers, it was uh, a matter of practical uh, consideration uh, to do that. Uh, let's see. Was William Sherman the originator of the total war strategy in modern times? Or was there a clear progression of direct violence against civilians leading up to the Civil War? Well, no, in, in antiquity, there were there were wars that were uh, brutal and, and harmed civilians. That's why um, people began uh, talking about uh, uh, the international laws of war and making uh, waging war on civilians, uh, the intentional bombing of towns and so forth, illegal and a war crime. And so uh, I wouldn't say Sherman was the very first person in, in history, but what had been happening for generations as of 1861 was the whole world was moving in the direction of understanding that war should not uh, involve the intentional targeting of civilians, the burning of cities, uh, and, and so forth. And so great progress had been made, but Lincoln and Sherman reversed all of that progress in the way they waged war, and a case can be made that they laid the template, so to speak, for uh, for the waging of war and the way it was waged in the 20th century, total war on civilians. Uh, my latest publication, by the way, is in the Independent Review, the current issue of the fall 2010 uh, uh, Independent Review, and uh, it, it's uh, the title is uh, "The Culture of Violence in the American West: Myth versus Reality." It's about the waging of war on the Plains Indians by the, all the same Civil War generals: Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Custer, Hancock. Uh, literally beginning three months after the end of, uh, after Appomattox, after the surrender at Appomattox, they waged a war of extermination against the Plains Indians, including the killing of women and children. And they, in the next 25 years, they would kill 45,000 or more of the Plains Indians. And in, in, in total war attacks, it wasn't just combatants. They, they would attack Indian villages with women and children. And uh, I think it's online now, my article, uh, and so uh, from the Independent Review. And so, uh, and so this continued by, this, by some of the same people. Uh, uh, General Sheridan, who uh, burned out the Shenandoah Valley after the Confederate Army had left, he is said to have uh, shocked the Prussians after the war when he went uh, and told the Prussian Army officers of his exploits in the Shenandoah Valley. Even they were shocked because they uh, had been well-schooled in, uh, in uh, the laws of international uh, law of war. And they knew that these were war crimes that, that uh, he was committing. But of course, the victors are never prosecuted for war crimes. Let's see. Uh, during any of the past wars of the 20th or 19th century, were there any actions related to autarky policy that were similar to the current currency valuations controversies? Uh, uh, well, if currency, uh, if currency interventions are meant to try to uh, create protectionism, to try to make the goods, uh, domestic goods, seem cheaper than uh, foreign-made goods, well, yeah, that's a form of protectionism. Uh, that's why uh, some people always thought, for example, that uh, Hamilton and his political descendants were dangerous because they were economic nationalists. They they were protectionists. Uh, they wanted to pursue policies that would be good for America, but at the expense of foreign countries. And that's antagonistic. That's, that's antagonistic toward uh, foreign countries. That's creating conflict. And these conflicts can sometimes uh, bubble up into war. 
and uh, and Jefferson was so anti-war that when uh, when the British began uh, confiscating American ships and kidnapping American sailors when Jefferson was president, he believed he had two choices: another war with Great Britain, or the choice that he did take a, a, a trade embargo. Uh, so he had two horrible choices: an embargo on foreign trade, which was very harmful, especially to New England, which is where the most of the shipping industry was coming out of, uh, which is another reason why New England uh, almost seceded from the Union uh, in 1814. And, and also, uh, uh, he didn't want to go to war. The war would be a tremendous cost in blood and treasure, much worse than any trade embargo could impose. And so uh, that was his thinking on, uh, on that. And, uh, so he was a free trader, but he was forced into a, a very bad uh, choice there with the, uh, the antagonism by the British. Let's see. Was West Virginia admitted as a slave state? Yes, it was. Uh, if, if so, how do you define a slave state? It's where slavery is legal. Uh, and West Virginia was a slave state, and it was legal, and Lincoln was uh, more than happy to have West Virginia in the Union. It was the last slave state to enter the Union. Uh, in fact, um, and of course, the whole thing was unconstitutional. The Constitution says that to create a new state uh, it requires the, uh, the uh, vote by the state legislature and uh, the governor, uh, as well as you know, the United States. And uh, that, of course, never happened. The Virginia legislature did not vote to allow part of their state to be carved up. The thing was orchestrated by Lincoln and the U.S. Army. And the the government of West Virginia was run out of Alexandria, Virginia by the Republican Party during the Civil War, and it did add a couple of electoral votes to Lincoln's tally in the 1864 election, by the way. And so, uh, yeah, it was the last slave state. Maryland was, uh, under, uh, was uh, under conquest. It was forced into the Union, and it was a slave state. They didn't end the slavery there. Uh, there were slaves in other border states that were occupied by the Union Army, like Missouri. And so uh, uh, slavery was okay as long as uh, you were in the Union, was basically Lincoln's position. As I said earlier, in his first inaugural address, he pledged his support to enshrine slavery in the Constitution. It had never been explicitly in the Constitution before, but Lincoln pledged his support uh, for that. Uh, let's see. Grayson, uh, Mark, revolutionary France. Uh, oh, there's an answer. Under the Jacobins uh, reintroduced so the war to the West before that. Okay. We're getting to the end of the road here, I guess, 850. What is the, um, Will Beasley, what is the role of foreign banks in the Civil War? Um, the North financed the war. Um, with uh, taxes, pervasive taxes. They introduced the first income tax ever, you know, and it was a um, progressive income tax during the war. Government borrowing, uh, and some of the borrowing was from foreign, foreign lenders, and the printing of money. The Legal Tender Act created the greenbacks, and there was, so there was uh, money printing that created quite a bit of inflation. Uh, the South financed the war much more with printing of money and created much higher rates of inflation and in, in some taxes and some borrowing. So there were foreign banks that, lend, that uh, did business with both sides uh, on the war, uh, but that, that had always been the case. Uh, foreign banks had always invested in, uh, in, in, uh, in business investments in America, and they, they bought some of the uh, bonds issued by, by the U.S. government, as far as that goes. Um, I get emails all the time from people with all sorts of conspiracy theories of uh, the reason there was a civil war was uh, the international bankers conspiracy, but I, I never pay much attention uh, to that. Um, let's see. Is Ron Paul's recall of all U.S. military inter intervention at this point realistic? Unrealistic. Uh, uh, Ron Paul is not against all military invention. He, he's in favor of uh, military intervention if it's used defensively, but he just thinks that uh, almost everything we're doing now has nothing to do with defending America. It has everything to do with imperialism and, and the making of 
huge mounds of money for politically connected businesses and and other people. And so, uh, uh, you know, 25 years ago, a uh, uh, few of us who were adults then uh, uh, thought that the Soviet Union Oh yeah. Okay, I'll, we'll we'll go for a few more minutes here. I guess for some people, people are start people are starting to check out. Uh, uh, what caused the 1857 downturn? Yeah, there was a recession. 1857 downturn. Um, uh, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it's usually monetary expansion. Uh, uh, we had we had uh, boom and bust cycles uh, prior prior to the, the Fed. I just, I just got Grayson on my my computer. I'll have to get rid of him. Um, so there was uh, there was all sorts of monetary interventions by states. Uh, there were at, at periods of history the government, the U.S. government, the federal government would uh, take it upon itself to subsidize banks and the creation of banks, and then they would urge them to uh, suspend specie payment, and that would create booms and busts periodically. And so, uh, and so, uh, there were a number of causes of this. I think this was one of them. Uh, you don't have to have a Fed or a central bank necessarily to have uh, booms and busts. But before we had central banking, the booms and busts were, were most, much shorter lived usually than, uh, than the ones we had after central banking. Okay. I think people are beginning to leave, and I think it's probably time to wrap it up. Uh, it's been more than an hour and a half, and I keep seeing Paul is at the meeting and so forth. And so, so uh, thanks for enrolling. I hope you get a lot out of the class. I'll do my best to uh, maximize your education, and, uh, and have a good night.